God aften og velkommen til vores litterære salon her i aften. Uh, det er dejligt at se jer. Uh, I'm going to switch to English now. It will be shifting back and forth between English and, and Danish throughout uh, this evening. Tonight, uh, on behalf of Screaming Books, I'm very, very honored to introduce to you for the first time in Denmark, at least in her capacity as an author, Daisy Johnson, who just today... <laughs> <laughs> And with her also, of course, a more well-known Danish author, uh, Peter Hu, also. <laughs> Tonight's uh, discussion will be moderated by uh, Rasmus Hastrup, who is an author in his own right, but he's also the translator of uh, Dan Danish, uh, Daisy's work into Danish. So Rasmus here is the third, the third person on the, on the floor. Um, So Daisy rose to quite quickly to literary fame in, in, in both England and now in Denmark. Uh, her second novel is out in Danish today. Today is the official publication day of Under Overflad and Everything Under. And uh, driving into Aarhus today, uh, the rave reviews started ticking in on our phones. So it's already been received very, very well in the Danish media. And obviously we're looking more forward to more coverage of, of course as, as publishers, but also, um, yeah, We're looking very much forward to this discussion. Peter Hur is, is, of course, also an author that's known to many of you. And, and just recently, Peter Hur was given the Orste Lund Prize just a couple of weeks ago as a testimony to his continued relevance in Danish cultural and literary life. So it, I'm very, very honored and, and happy for, to introduce the two of you, three of you uh, <laughs> for tonight's event. So. Um, We, we have decided that there is really no manuscript of how we're going to do these things tonight. So Peter will also read a little bit from Daisy's work in Danish and talk in Danish and then translate into English. So we'll switch between the languages so no one will be felt left out at any point, hopefully. So thank you very much. Thank you. Asmus, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to see you, everybody. To see everybody here. And I, actually, I think I'll just uh, pass the ball to Peter. You're going to read a little bit. Yeah. Jeg vil også sige, at jeg synes også, det er rigtig hyggeligt at være her. Det er jo på en måde, det er jo en intim forsamling. Det er jo lidt som en dagligstue, eller sådan en slags like public living room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And, um, Jeg fik, øh, jeg fik sendt øh, Daisy's øh, første bog af Screaming Books, og den gjorde øh, et øh, rigtig stort indtryk på mig. Øh, the books have made a great impression on me. Så hvad jeg er rigtig optaget af i aften, det er at prøve at formidle til jer lidt om, øh, hvad, hvad, hvad de har betydet for mig. And I would like to convey some of that uh, impression, if, if it's possible, to the audience. På en måde så er det jo bedst at lade bøger tale selv. Så hvis det er okay for jer, så vil jeg læse en uh, lille smule fra begyndelsen af Søstre. Fordi det er sådan, uh, med, med stor kunst, ligesom i musik, så er meget ofte hele tematikken og uh, grundstemningen, til stede i næsten matematisk kort form, helt fra begyndelsen. Like in other pieces of great art and music, very often the themes uh, and, and the whole atmosphere is in, in a concentrated form, present from the very beginning. Så jeg læser lidt for jer i begyndelsen af Søstre. Men man tror øh, ofte som læser, at det er bogen eller, eller kunsten, hvis det nu er billeder, man ser på, eller musikken, som man lytter til, som skal gøre arbejdet. Men hvad man glemmer, det er, at man glemmer på en måde sig selv. Fordi i virkeligheden er det at, at nyde eller tage imod kunst, det er en intens kreativ proces inde i en selv. Der begynder med det samme at udspille sig billeder og rejse sig forestillinger osv. Så det bedste, man kan gøre for at tage imod en bog, det er ligesom lige et øjeblik at mærke sin krop 
at slappe af og ligesom åbne systemet til det uventede eller ukendte, som kommer. Så hvis vi lige bare trækker vejret et øjeblik. As a, as a reader, you often think that it's the author that has to do, or the book that has to do the work. But, but, you, but reading books is an active, creative process in itself. So I just suggest that we breathe one or two times and just relax and open the body, because reading books is also a very bodily uh, uh, experience. Ja, to søster. Min søster er et sort hul. Min søster er en tornado. Min søster er endestationen. Min søster er den låste dør. Min søster er et skud i togen. Min søster venter på mig. Min søster er træ, der vælter. Min søster er et tilmuret vindue. Min søster er et ønskeben. Min søster er nattoget. Min søster er den sidste pose chips. Min søster er at sove længe. Min søster er en skovbrand. Min søster er et søgende skib. Min søster er huset for enden af gaden. Første del, den hedder September og July. Et hus skiver af det gennem hækken hen over markerne. Snavset ved et hvidt vindue dybt inde mellem murstenene. Hånd i hånd på bagsædet et spyd af lys fra soltaget. Vi to skulder ved skulder deler luft. Der var ved at igen. Deler luft. Lang vej nu op langs landets rygsøjle. Vi strejfer ringvejen rundt om Birmingham, videre forbi Nottingham, Sheffield og Leeds, til vi gennembryder peninerne. I år er vi hjemsøgte. Hvad? Dette er året, hvor vi som alle andre år er vendeløse, kun nødvendige for os selv. I år ventede vi på dem i regnen ved den gamle tennisbane, lyde i radioen. Højere temperaturer sydfra, politiet i Whitby, den viskende lød af mors hænder på rattet. Vores tanker som svaler. Forenden af bilen, der hæver og sænker sig som en stæv. Havet er derude. Vi trækker dynen op over hovedet. Og i år er der noget andet, der er redselen. So, I have the pri privilege to ask the first question. Jeg får lov at spørge Daisy om noget. Og vi, vi har siddet ud. Øh, vi, vi kender ikke hinanden. Det er først nu, vi møder hinanden. Vi har lavet en lille øh, sådan videospøg med hinanden på afstand, som nogle af jer måske har læst. Men det er først nu for øh, halvanden time siden, at vi for første gang sidder sammen. It's one and a half or two hours ago we met for the first time, and, and I, I told, mentioned this video joke that we made. But, uh, men, og vi har med vilje ikke snakket om bøgerne, fordi at vi ville gennemtrykke til jer. Fordi hvis vi havde plapret for meget om det, så gassen gassen ligesom gået af ballonen. Så, og vi har ikke forberedt det her, altså, så det vil sige, Daisy ved ikke, hvad jeg kommer til at spørge om. Så, so, um, Daisy... Uh, My first question is that it's obvious from the very beginning of the book, and it continues through this book and also the, the, the down under the on our offland that we're going to talk about, that the body is so important. Mm -hmm. It is very physical books, if you will allow me that. And normally we are used to thinking about books as something mental. So. I, I, found, I find that one of the very special qualities is that uh, the books in themselves are, are investigating or unfolding a bodily aspect in so many ways. There's so much 
Sweat, smells, taste of food, so much temperature felt on skin. It is as if every, and I, I, when I look in the details, it's like every chapter and every scene is being linked into a physical reality. So, so what, what does it mean to you? And is writing books also a physical mm -hmm. reality? And I just translate. So, so Daisy's bøger er øh, for mig at se utrolig kropslige. Ikke? Der er så meget øh, sved og blodet og øh, øh, smagen af mad og øh, følelsen af stof på huden. Så, så mit spørgsmål til Daisy er, er det, øh, hvad rolle spiller kroppen og er selve det at skrive, som vi jo lidt kommer til at forestille sig noget, der foregår i hovedet, er det også en kropslig oplevelse? Um, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I think, I think at first I'm always really interested in writing characters who for some reason or other are very close to their own body and what their own body is doing. Um, so the, the beginning of Sisters that you read, it's two teenage girls um, who are very, very close in age and who experience life um, almost as, as double people, you know. Um, one of them smells something and the other one feels like maybe they smell it as well. Um, I also always really wanted to write about characters who live in live very close to nature, for example, or um, live in places where nature is beginning to insert itself. So in, um, in Sisters, um, they travel to this house um, in Yorkshire, in the north of England, um, and nature begins pushing in through the walls and the birds begin finding their way through the plaster, um, and the Sisters feel all of this. And everything under it's set on the canals, Um, and it's a very difficult life, you know, you're um, living on a canal boat, you're very close to the water, you're also very close to your own bodily functions and your own dirt, and um, and I think the books that I loved reading, especially when I was younger, were books where you, yeah, you could you could smell what the characters were smelling, or you could hear what the characters were hearing, and you could, you could feel it. Um, i don't know. I think it is. I think writing does feel like a physical activity. You know, you're you're sat down for such a long time, <laughs> and you're so lonely, and you're on your own. But it does, but you do feel physically exhausted. I think at the end of um, a writing session. I don't know how you feel when you're writing. May I just translate? Please, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and uh, jeg oversætter også på min egen skyld, for ligesom, og så får man det en gang til. Altså Daisy fortæller, at uh, den her begyndelse af søstre, som jeg læste op, det er uh, juli og september, de to søstre, der har en meget speciel relation. Og de er på en måde så tæt ved hinanden, så når den ene lugter eller smager noget, så mærker den anden det. Og de er øh, på, et, på et sted, altså i overgangen mod voksenlivet, så det, de, de er på vej ud på landet til et meget specielt hus, hvor familien har boet tidligere. Og der begynder naturen udefra at presse sig ind gennem huset. Øh, fugle fl øh, finder vej ind gennem væggene, og, øh, og, og indefra bryder seksualiteten også igennem på en meget sådan, smuk og også råt skildret måde. Og, øh, og, og deres, så deres relation er rigtig fysisk, og Daisy nævner også, at under overfladen den, den anden bog, den foregår ved kanalerne, og øhm, hvor man, som det er, når man lever ombord på skibe, hovedpersonen lever ombord på en båd, øh, der er man meget tæt på naturen, også på både godt og ondt. Og så fortæller Daisy, at skriveprocessen er også meget fysisk, at selve den, de lange stræk af alenehed, som er, når man skriver, at det på en måde også konfronterer en med ens uh, krop. May I read a little, sure. little further? Yeah, because in a way that's uh, nice for the audience to have the, to, to hear. Um, også den, uh, det, det kan I allerede høre fra begyndelsen, intensiteten, altså den sproglige intensitet, som også er det, som uh, Daisy, noget af det, Daisy har fået så meget anerkendelse for. The, 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 the intensity of your language. Uh, som i sig selv jo på en måde er kropslig. Så i år er det noget andet. Der er rejslen. Vejen sniger sig væk og forsvinder af, synes, af syne. Rystelser, rystelser, rystelser. Da vi går fra asfalt til grus, 
de er på vej ud mod det her hus, de kommer længere og længere ud i landskabet og naturen. Græder mor? Jeg ved det ikke. Skal vi spørge? Umuligt at svare på. Og desuden er huset der nu, og der er ikke tid til at gå tilbage og prøve igen, eller at gøre det anderledes. Det her året, hvor vi er huset, lys i alle vinduer, døre, som ikke kan lukkes af os helt. Når den ene af os taler, mærker vi begge ordene bevæge sig på tungen. Når den ene af os spiser, mærker vi begge maden glide ned gennem halsen. Det ville ikke overraske nogen af os, hvis vi blev skåret op, og det blev opdaget, at vi delte organer. At den enes lunger trak vejret for os begge, at et hjerte slog med en dobbelt febrilsk puls. Er noget, Christian? Er det okay? Ja. Yeah. Um, it has to do with gender. Uh, The, the rise of the novel, mm -hmm. of the modern novel, took place in, in uh, 17th century England. Mm -hmm. And it was all carried primarily by men. And the novel has been <coughs> carried mainly by men. So one of the very thing we're experiencing now is a global shift where, where uh, female qualities are uh, getting the, the, the place that, that are needed for everybody and that they deserve. So uh, my, my question is, these um, very complex female characters that are the main characters in your books, or very often are, mm -hmm. although the men, the men are there, and also with men in your answer, but, but the female, the, the, they are, The books are, I hope you agree, also uh, unfolding of, of a female perspective. How do you feel being a woman, writing about women in a genre that, that until recently had been uh, 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 monopolized by men? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, women have always written, I suppose, but And, and certainly in the United Kingdom, um, the majority of people who buy books are women. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, for a long, long time, the people who were winning the prizes were men. Um, and a lot of books that we were reading, um, you know, had male protagonists. And so when I was studying English literature as a, um, when I was younger, a lot of the books we were given to read featured male protagonists. And um, And so when I started writing, I really wanted to write about what it was, what it meant to be a woman, um, and potentially that's why, you know, you were, talk you were talking about kind of their, their books very involved in the body, potentially in a, um, an oppressive way in some ways. Um, and I wanted to write very much about what it means to be a woman and have a body. Um, and that's something I think we're talking about more and more, you know, we're beginning to open up about, um, the kind of extreme nature of what it means to be a woman and have a body and, um, you know, from the beginning be constantly noticed but at the same time parts of your experience sort of um, erased. Um, and so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of sisters in the books, there's a lot of mothers in the books. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's what I wanted to try and do um, and obviously The experience of being a woman is, is opening up and, yeah, um, it's ch we're talking more and more about what it means and who can be a woman and where it comes from and I think that's really, really fascinating and I am excited about how many books there are at the moment exploring that, but um, I will embarrass you momentarily, although I know you won't want me to, but, you know, as a teenager picking up Miss Miller's Feeling for Snow um, off my parents' bookcase, I must have been 13, which I feel is maybe too young <laughs> um, to read it, but it was very, very rare for me at the time to find a man who was writing from a woman's point of view so um, eloquently, I think. Um, and so that was very, very exciting and I think was potentially part of the reason I wanted to write from women's point of view and write from women who are, in a way, in the way Miss Miller is, you know, difficult and... Um, troubled and trying to find her own direction and yeah. <laughs>
Can I just ask you something here? Because mm -hmm. the mothers in these two books are obviously very troubled individuals. Mm -hmm. um, one is depressed and the other is just kind of weird and drinks too much. <laughs> is, is that a comment on, on the difficulties of being a woman in, in this day and age? Or, mm -hmm. or why are the mothers like that? Yeah, I think, I, you know, I think from a very young age when you're a woman, you're asked when you're going to be a mother. You know, you're asked how many children are you going to have and what are their names going to be and um, what's your husband's name going to be. Um, <laughs> and I was really interested in writing about mothers who struggle to fit into, you know, the, the mould of the mother that we would like them to be. Um, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm a mother now and when you become a mother, you're, you're expected to be this sort of glowing, perfect pinnacle of, you know, um, supreme peace. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I became a mother, and I thought this is this is as far from <laughs> peaceful experience. Um, and so I really, really wanted to explore mothers who struggled with that and who couldn't fit themselves into what being a mother was like, and tried to find ways around it, and you know, very much do their best. Um, but in some cases, particularly everything under their best is not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, also the Jesus movement. Yeah. Ja, jeg spurgte, jeg spurgte Daisy, øh, altså øh, fra øh, den moderne romans opkomst, den, den, den opstår i 1700-tallet i England, først som brevsamling, og man ikke ved, om det er fiktive eller ej, der samles til romaner, ikke? og så kommer Robinson Crusoe og så videre, ikke? altså de her tidlige berømte romaner, vi kender. Der har den genre været båret af mænd, og på en måde er selve den måde at arbejde på, altså det her langsigtede, jangagtige, forfølgende spor, det har indtil for ikke så lang tid siden været primært båret af mænd. Så jeg var nysgerrig efter, eller jeg spurgte Daisy, hvordan føles det at skrive om kvinder som kvinde i en genre, der indtil for nylig har været øh, monopoliseret i, i vid udstrækning af mænd, selvom som Daisy siger, jo siger, kvinder altid har skrevet. Og, øh, og også, når jeg spørger, så er det også fordi, at, at jeg oplever selv, at et af de helt afgørende globale skift, det er den her ændring i balancen mellem mandlig og kvindelig. Ikke? Altså alt det her med MeToo og så videre, det ligger jo inde i nogle kolossale skift. Altså hvis vi tænker på Pixar's film, ikke? så har vi øh, øh, altså, mens, øh, produkter, der når milliarder af mennesker, som har kvindelige helte. Og hvordan er det? Og, øh, og Daisy fortæller så, hvordan at hun øh, øh, har været fra, fra, øh, i, i løbet af sin studietid. Hun har studeret engelsk litteratur, og da hun begyndte at skrive, har hun været meget optaget af at, øh, at øh, fremstille verden fra et kvindeligt perspektiv. Og også som selv nu hun selv blevet mor og øh, er optaget af, altså fordi så, spørg, så, så, så bliver hun spurgt, hvad... Øh, hvad, hvorfor de her møder og, og komplekse og konfliktfyldte moderbilleder. Og det I siger, så hun er optaget af at punktere eller nuancere det stereotype moderbillede af den perfekte mor, der bare er en, et mirakel af fred og, og overskud. Fordi hun opdagede, at hun selv fik barn, så var det, om jeg så må sige, det stik modsat. Would you like to ask a question, as well? So you got. <laughs> well, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's it's it's, it's very interesting because you're obviously both very creative people, and I think I would like to just take everything just a level up and ask you a bit about creativity because I think it's very very interesting. Because what is creativity? Where does it come from? When you write books, is there some sort of creative well that you can draw from, or is it just hard work now I need to write five pages before I can eat lunch, or what is creativity to you people as writers? Would you like to begin, Peter? Yeah, where creativity? Uh, are there, are there, uh en 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 brønd, man ligesom kan stikke spanden ned i, og så øse af, eller... Um, Jeg tror, jeg tror uh, først og fremmest, uh, at det er et uh, mysterium. I think that it's basically a mystery. 
that, that uh, vi finder aldrig, tror jeg, nogen forklaring. We will never find a, a really satisfying explanation. But, but still, we, we have to try. <laughs> so although we, know, we, we will never get there, we, it, it's, uh, it, it can be fun and it's probably also necessary to circampulate this mystery. Selvom vi ikke finder frem, så er det sjovt at gå rundt om mysteriet og, og, og prøve at snakke om det. Um, Yeah, yeah, I was interested in meditation. I'm also interested in meditation, as we've been talking about. And uh, in in meditation, you you uh, seek or you look for the source, as a kill, at the man leder efter in meditation, eller den menneskelige essence. Hvad er der inderst i et enkelt menneske, og hvad er der inderst i kærligheden, inderst i kreativiteten? What is the very core of creativity and love and uh, compassion and uh, um, so in in meditation it's basically an attempt to to move away from the phenomenal world and towards where does this world come from where does it unfold from because as the the brain resort researchers say we are constructing this world. Vi, vi laver den her verden. Den er en illusion, det siger hjerneforskerne. Det er noget, vi hele tiden udfolder af bevidstheden, men, men, men det er noget, vi laver. Og, og i meditation forsøger man at komme hen til det sted, hvor den her kolossale fælles kreativitet, som er at skabe verden, som ligesom en kolossal roman, der hele tiden opstår, hvor kommer den fra? And, uh, and I think that creativity has to open the same way. Kreativiteten er nødt til at åbne i samme retning ind mod kilden, ind mod der, hvor det kommer fra. Men hvor man i meditation bare bevæger sig mod kilden, where in meditation you just move to the source. In creativity you at the same time move towards the expression, altså ud mod bogen, ud mod maleriet, ud mod dansen, ud mod sangen eller musikken. Så, så kreativitet er åben, eller prøver at åbne i begge retninger, både indad og så ud mod andre mennesker i det forsøg på at udtrykke et eller andet vigtigt for en. Så so vi try to we open inwardly and outwardly at the same time. And, um, And that's why I think in all creativity there's a deep wish of meeting other people because what because what is what you find deep inside is an, a longing for real contact with with other people. We are always divided. We never completely connect with each other. So what we are looking for in creativity is we connect as deep as we can to ourselves. Vi forbinder os, vi, vi, vi mærker så dybt vi kan i os selv, og så går vi ud mod andre med bogen, eller med sangen, eller med bare det, vi siger, i et, i et håb om at blive mødt. Um. <laughs> yeah, something, um, something happened, I suppose, with my creativity the last five years or so, which is that it became, um, it became connected to paying my mortgage. Um, and, and paying the electricity bills. Um, and that really changed the experience, I think, um, of, um, of sitting down at a desk and trying, to, um, and trying to follow wherever the creativity would go. And um, Peter and I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but did a, did some quest- sent some questions to each other. And we talked a little bit about this, you know, where is creativity and can you follow it and what happens if you walk away from it um, and for me it, I, I'm an awful person to live with because I'm very very emotionally connected to how the writing is going um, <laughs> so when the writing is going well I think I'm very joyful and when it is not I'm an awful awful person to share a house with um, and sometimes it, it really feels as if there's someone else stood behind your shoulder and they're uh, you know and they're leading you forward through the project. The majority of time for me, it really doesn't feel like that. It very much feels like you try and you try and you try and you try. And hopefully at some point, um, it feels successful 
to you or it feels successful to someone else. Um, and my process of writing a book is very much um, writing an entire draft and then deleting all of it and starting again um, and crying <laughs> a lot. Um, but in that, in that process of um, writing and deleting, each time there'll be something else which I can keep or I'll know slightly more about what the book should be or what the themes are or um, what, I'm try what I'm trying to write about. And obviously, and I've, I've heard Peter speak about this before a little, part of the problem of writing a book is that you, every single day when you sit down, you're, you're a different person than you were the day before. Um, and it, you know, everything undertook a long time to write, and the book I'm currently working on, I've been working on for four years. Um, and four years ago, pre-COVID, pre a baby, I was completely different. Um, and so the, the, book, the book changes as you change, and you try and, you try and morph it, and you try and hold on to it, and at some point you have to, uh, you have to let it go ahead of you and try and catch it. And then at some point it is, it is a book, um, and at that point, I think you have to you have to give it over to the readers, and it doesn't belong to you anymore. Um, and there is um, peace in that, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Vil du ikke oversætte lidt af det? Jo, jo. Um, det der ikke siger her, det er jo, at um, kreativitet skifter. Um, det, er, det er forskellige ting på forskellige tidspunkter. Det kan være forbundet med at skulle betale huslejen og elektricitetsregningen. Um, og der er også det at sige til det, at det her kreative flow, man kan komme i, det kan være svært at, at ramme, fordi man altid er en forskellig person. Man er ikke den person, man var dagen før, når man sætter sig på skrivebordet. Og um, Everything Under under overfladen um, tog meget lang tid at skrive. Det tog uh, forskellige år, fordi at det hele tiden er noget nyt, der sker. Så kommer der covid, så kommer der en baby, og det ene og det andet, og så fremdeles. Så, så derfor ændrer den person, man er sig. Den, den person, man er, ændrer sig hele tiden. Og derfor er man en, en, en ny person, der sætter sig ned og prøver at lave den samme bog. Og det er ikke altid lige let. Øh, så det, det jeg siger, hun gør, det er, at hun først skriver et helt udkast til en bog, og så kan se at stort set dele. Og så skriver hun begynder forfra. Og kan se det mest af det også. Men hver eneste gang, så er der måske en lille, bitte, en lille græn af et eller andet, der bliver tilbage, eller noget, man finder ud af, som man kan bruge i den videre proces fremad. Så, så det er... Det er en kreativitet, man kan forhåbentlig kan finde, men det er også hårdt arbejde, som jeg kan forstå. Så... Ja. <laughs> Må jeg læse en lille bid af under overfladen? Ja, vi snakker om den bog. Det er Rasmus, der har oversat bogen. Og, øh... Jeg har set mange oversættelser i mit liv. Det, det, den her er meget speciel. It's a very special translation. Det, man kigger efter, når man skal vurdere oversættelser og, og oversætte skøn litteratur, det er bare meget, meget vanskeligt. Og, og det er da også derfor, at der er meget få mennesker, der kan i et hvert land. Man ved ligesom, hvem der virkelig kan. Og det her, det er sådan en oversættelse. Det, man kan vurdere det på, det er, om man noget sted kan opdage eller føle, at det er en oversat bog. Og det kan man overhovedet ikke her. Så det er en slags en sømløs øh, gen, gengivelse. Det er jo reelt en, en gendækning. Så so I, I uh, uh, describe for, for the audience how uh, it doesn't at all read like a translated book. It's uh, seamlessly done. Under overfladen. De steder, vi er født kommer tilbage. De forklæder sig som migræner, maveunder, søvnløser. De er måden, hvorpå vi samtidig vågner faldende, fumler efter kontakten til sengelampen, overbevist om, at alt det, vi har bygget op, er forsvundet i nattens løb. Vi bliver fremmede for de steder, vi er født. De genkender os ikke, men vi genkender altid dem. De er meget for os, aflet ind i os. Hvis vi blev vendt på vrangen, ville der være, være et kort skåret ind i bagsiden af vores hud. Bare så vi kunne finde tilbage. Men på bagsiden af min hud er der ikke skåret kanaler og jernbaner og en båd, men altid dig. 
Um, Daisy, uh, to return to this question about køn, for at vende tilbage til det her spørgsmål om mand og kvinde. Uh, what, what, uh, when, you, when, I, when as a man I hold a book in my hand and it's written by a woman, there's of course a, a slight um, fear Will, I, will this universe have a place for me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> altså, når jeg løfter og åbner en bog, der er skrevet en kvinde, så er der noget i manden i mig, der tænker, øh, må jeg godt være her også? And what is very, very remarkable for me is that uh, although it there's this uh, colossal unfolding of the female universe, as a man, you feel welcome. I, I, I can see no uh, anger or bitterness or uh, on the contrary, I feel there's a deep understanding of men. Der, der er en dyb forståelse for det mandlige i de her bøger. Um, og uh, even where the men uh, fall short of, of their duties and leave uh, family and children, even when where men are, uh, hvad hedder, overgriber på engelsk? Some sort of predators, you know. Yeah, yeah, even, yeah. even where where men are, are uh, uh, aggressive or sexually aggressive, there is a very deep understanding of the male uh, psychology. I feel. So is it? How does? How how do you? When it's here to body, how do you look at that? That 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 this balance and and what then at the lookers? How do you succeed in not? Uh, pushing the, the, the male perspective away as something uh, alien mm-hmm. in the um, groups. Yeah, I'm glad that um, I succeeded in that way. I think I think everything under him in particular is just a, a book about um, many people trying and failing in many ways. So um, all of the characters are Um, you know, are struggling and aren't do, are not and are not able to do their best, and you know the female characters are as well. It's also a book I really wanted to. So, um, everything under is a retelling of a Greek myth, um, and I, I won't say which which myth. But um, when I was reading the Greek myths, there's so much fluidity in them. You know, between um, between genders, and I really wanted everything under to feel. To, to inhabit that. Um, so um, there are characters who change gender, um, there's a trans character, um, and it's a book set on the river. It's a book somewhere between land and water, um, set on canal boats. Um, and so I really wanted it to kind of inhabit that space, I think, that fluid space. Yeah. How about you? How do you, how do you go about writing women characters? Does it take? Do you feel as if you have to get into a particular space to write a woman character? In a way, you might not have to write a male character. Um, det er sidst svaret på mit spørgsmål det her med hvordan lykkes det ikke at eller at undgå altså at få et uh, at skabe et univers hvor 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 den mandlige psykologi også kan føle sig velkommen. Og Daisy siger, at hun, hun er glad for, at hun også selv føler, at det til en eller anden grad er lykkedes, og at, øh, at det har været en del af, af det, hun er optaget af, det er, eller bestræbelsen på, det er at finde eller beskrive en verden, hvor begge køn er til stede og interagerer med hinanden. Og hun, øh, øh, hun siger, at under overfladen bygger på en bestemt græsk myte, hun vil ikke røbe hvilken, men det der sker, som jo gør i græsk mytologi, køn skifte og, og er også overgangsformer mellem, øh, mellem kønnene. Og så spørger hun mig, øh, hvordan det er for mig at skrive fra et kvindeligt perspektiv, som jeg har gjort øh, flere gange. Øhm og, og så må jeg svare, altså for mig var det, er det sådan set ikke øh, et projekt. Altså der er meget mindre rationelt projekt i bøger, i hvert fald i mine bøger, end man måske normalt tror. For me it was never a project. Mm-hmm. It was spontaneous. I, I think books, at least my books, are much more spontaneous than we used to think. We think that they must be carefully planned and so on. But it's often ju- it's also just uh, riding along and seeing what's happening, mm-hmm. or like uh, uh, entering a horse and, and then let it do what it will. Like, someone sets up on his, or someone will me. Men jeg tror, øh, 
et, et, et meget stor del af mit liv har handlet om forholdet til det kvindelige. Til min mor, til mine døtre, til mine kærlighedspartnere, til de kvinder, jeg arbejder sammen med. Og øh, som tiden er gået, er jeg blevet stadig mere opmærksom på, hvor sandt det er, at vi i os har begge køn. Altså som mand har man en, også en kvinde indvendig. Og rejsen ind mod at få kontakt med hende er en afgørende længsel eller bestræbelse. Jeg tror i alle mænd og i alle kvinder omkring at få kontakt i det mandlige. Uanset hvordan ens seksualitet er, så har man i hvert fald to køn, alle mennesker inde i sig selv. I, I, first of all, the, the, con- the contact with women, with my daughters and my love partners and my mother has been uh, of enormous importance. Uh, and, and one of the most challenging and, and rewarding and, uh, tasks of life. And, and as the years go by, I uh, intensely experience that it's true what many of the great uh, thinkers said. We have both sexes in us. I am not only a man, I'm also a woman. And to, co- and to connect with uh, the other gender uh, in yourself is, uh, if you want a whole life and a meaningful life, then you have to find these qualities in yourself. If not, you're only half. So for me, the books taking the perspective of a woman is, uh, uh, I think, part of a journey towards my, the, the woman and myself. At, at det er en måde, når jeg taler som en kvinde i bøgerne på, at prøve at nærme mig en kvinde ind i mig. And then it's also fun. It's like carnival, where I dress like a woman and take a skirt, shirt on, and that feeling of, of a, a, Uh, go, uh, going all over a border, that's also dangerous. Mm. Så so der er også lidt gadedreng i at uh, optræde som kvinde, og så se om slipper man nu godt fra det. Yeah. So do you know from the very beginning what gender, what sex your protagonist is going to be? Do you know this book is about a woman? Do you know that from the, from the start? It does that sort of arise along the way? Ja, om jeg ved det fra begyndelsen. Yes, yes uh, ja, det ved jeg. Uh, yeah. Because uh, I had to do, for me, a novel, the novel arises in, in, on a fine line between what is carefully prepared and what is completely uh, loosely improvised. And, and part of finding that balance is uh, that I make a lot of preparations And, and uh, I, I sit for, uh, when I start a new book, uh, I will sit for some weeks without writing one word, just memorizing or trying sentences and finding the language mask of the main characters, some of the main characters. And there I have to know what, what, what is, what sex and what age and uh, yeah. Jeg forbereder mig på den måde. Altså, romaner opstår for mig i, i et øh, spændingsfelt mellem det omhyggeligt forberedte og det improviserede. Så jeg vil sidde øh, lænet op ad væggen i nogle uger og bare prøve at lade sætninger rulle, og så dukker langsomt den specielle sprogmaske op, som hovedpersonen har, eller, eller nogle sprogmasker for nogle af hovedpersonerne, og så, begynd, og så er der lavet forberedelse, og så på et eller andet tidspunkt er der nok til at gå i gang men ikke så meget, at det kvæler det, at hver, dy, hver dag skal være, skal man overraske sig selv. Also, every day has to be a surprise to keep up. Uh, it, it has to be, it has to be um, lyst, hvad hedder det på engelsk? Uh, yes, yeah, it has to be based on design, based on, you know, mm-hmm. wishing to do that. Uh, so, yeah, okay. you need to keep yourself interested, basically, by surprising It has to be fun, it has to be yeah. a playful quality, yes. where you have the pos- possibility of surprising yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I love the phrase language mask. Yeah. I think that's a really, um, yeah, a really, really wonderful way of trying, of trying to talk about a book. And I think um, maybe maybe that's why it takes so long to write a book because I, fi- I find that language mask very, very difficult to find, you know. And I think I always want the character, I always want the reader to feel in some way through the language what the characters are, are experiencing. And so every book has to have a different um, language mask. Um, are there particular ways you go about? finding that language mask, particular techniques you have? No. <laughs> Tell me all of your tricks. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, 
I, I really think it's it's a, a, a lot about creativity is a, a mystery. They did mystery like 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 uh, love. We we were talking about when we were eating together. We had a nice meal that they make here at the Musikhus, so they think it's a really good meal. So so they are really happy to snack it together. The days is full of of we are coming together here at um, at uh, we we. Der er en gåde i bøger, ikke? Man kan også høre det, når jeg læser højt, ikke? Altså, der, man kommer ind i sådan en, en, der er en enorm intensitet. Og så tænker man, når man er færdig med bogen, så vil man gerne have mere identitet, den intensitet. Og så vil man gerne hen til Daisy og ligesom bore for at finde mere af den. Men, men uh, that, that the intensity that you are enjoying, when, the, when you close the book, you want more. So you go to the author. Men det er meget sjældent der. Fordi det er en bestemt mystisk tilstand, hvor man kommer ind i kreativ flow, og det er der, det er. Det, når det lukker, så sidder der jo bare øh, to øh, hængeører, hvor der ligesom ikke er noget særligt at hente. Så, 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 og så selve den tilstand, så so, so when, when, when we don't write, we're just uh, uh, yeah, uh, taking care of the baby or buying it's going to the grocery or whatever we're doing. So there's nothing special there. So the mystery is there mm-hmm. and it cannot be grasped. Man kan ikke fange det. Mm-hmm. But, but you have to talk about it. Yes. In, in, in a way. <laughs> yeah. May I ask Daisy, would it be possible to hear you read a little in mm-hmm. English? May, may I choose? Please, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, så so, so, so synes jeg, at uh, det ville være vidunderligt. Nu skal vi have sidste uh, her. Uh, hvis Daisy læser videre, fordi vi, vi har de her to søstre, der har den her voldsomme, passionerede relation. Uh, kærlighed og had og tiltrækning og frastødning. Og, uh, uh, og så um, um, og på vej til det her uh, uh, fantastiske hus. Som, som Daisy også skriver, eller som, som der står i den anden bog, vi er huse, altså billeder af mennesker som bygninger, og den måde, man ligesom smelter sammen med det sted, man bor eller har boet som barn, er beskrevet med en enorm intensitet. Så nu uh, beder vi Daisy, we will ask Daisy read about, uh, the, she continues where I ended, and that's where they have arrived at this house. Just a little? Just a little, yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Here it is. This the house we have come to. This the house we have left to find. Beached up on the side of the North York Moors, only just out of the sea. Our lips puckered and wrinkled from licking crisp salt. Limbs heavy, wrought with growing pains. The boiling hot steering wheel, the glare off the road. It has been hours since we left, buried in the back seat. Mum said, getting into the car, let's make it before night, and then nothing else for a long time. We imagine what she might say, this is your fault, or we would never have had to leave if you hadn't done what you did. And what she means, of course, as if we hadn't been born, if we hadn't been born at all. I squeeze my hands together, not being able to tell yet what the fear is of, only that it is enormous. The house is here, squatting like a child by the small slate wall, the empty sheep field behind pitted with old excrement, thorn bushes tall as a person. Thank you. <laughs> it, it's personal to <laughs> um, Daisy, um, we, we, we found out before that you, you, you have the age of my oldest daughter. <laughs> so I could be your father in a way, uh, yeah, technically. Uh, so, so Daisy is the oldest of my oldest daughter. So uh, these books were conceived and written by, we could say, a very young person. Mm-hmm. Så det, det er et ung menneske, der har skrevet i, i hvert fald de, den første af de bøger. But, but there, I feel, der er så dyb en viden om, øh, om døden, om seksualiteten, om fødsler, om 
skæbnesvang og relationer mellem mennesker om vold og om tilgivelse og om kærlighed. Så jeg undrer mig over, hvordan kan så, og det vil jeg spørge Daisy om nu, når jeg oversætter det, hvordan kan så ungt et menneske skrive om så dybe erfaringer på en måde, som er overbevisende? Det er det, der er intet ligesom pretentiøst altså pretentiøst overbøgerne. Der er sådan en helt nøgen ærlighed. Så so, uh, we have to say that, that, that uh, uh, at least the first of the books is written by a fairly young person. And, and uh, still there is, I find, a very deep knowledge of the, some of the deepest questions of life, of death and birth and anger and uh, forgiveness and aggression and sexuality. Um, how is it possible Uh, for for to, for such a young person to have written about such so, such deep experiment, uh, experiences, and I never felt that this is um, uh, learning from books or there is a kind of nakedness in all your writing, an unprotected, non pretentious, you mm. know, uh, honesty. How is that possible? That's very kind. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Yeah, obviously, obviously you started writing, I think, at a very similar age, or you were publishing at a very similar age to the age I was publishing. I think a lot of it has come from books, you know, has come from reading books um, when I was very, very young and constantly ingesting books and constantly thinking, how has this person made me feel this particular way? And, and you know, I think, I think writers, not all writers have it, but I think writers should have a, an awe towards literature um, and, a, and a need to explore doing the same thing in their writing. Um, I suppose something comes about when you're, when you're young and, and you're writing um, in that, and I, I find myself potentially more and more afraid as I get older and I try writing, you know, I think more about my reader, I think more about um, what publishing a book means, I think more about uh, how am I going to win this particular prize? You know, is this opening sentence the kind of prize the Booker Prize would really, really like? Um, and I didn't think that way when I was writing when I was 23. You know, you don't know, you don't think anyone's going to read it. And I think potentially um, that is very, that is a bit of a, a, a gift. Um, and I don't know if you felt the same way because you were very young as well when you started writing. And um, I wonder if having that slight blindness towards what publishing a book means is actually quite a wonderful thing. Yeah. Vil du ikke oversætte det? Jo, det vil jeg gerne. Jo, det stemmer. Øhm, det der ikke siger, at meget af den viden faktisk kommer fra at læse bøger. Det er, det er hentet i andre folks bøger. Det er meget vigtigt som forfatter at læse, og det hele tiden tilegne sig erfaringer og sprog af den, af den vej. Øhm, efterhånden, som hun er blevet ældre, den lille smule ældre hun er blevet, øhm, der kommer hun til at tænke mere og mere på, hvad der virker også i sådan i et, et større publicistisk perspektiv, øhm, hvad der virker over for priskomiteer og potentielle læsere og forlæggere osv. Så, videre. så muligvis var det faktisk en fordel for hende som, som helt ung, som 30 år, jeg begynder at skrive, uden egentlig at vide, hvad det gik ud på. Altså simpelthen bare at skrive uden noget specifikt formål, andet end det at skrive. Så det er jo ret interessant. Øhm, så så den ærlighed og nøgenhed, som Peter talte om, den, den, den er bestemt til stede, men, men det betyder ikke noget, at man selv har oplevet de, og gjort sig de store erfaringer, som bøgerne beskriver. We should ask uh, Rasmus a question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, fordi at, uh, no, uh, det er fordi, at uh, oversættere er så helt utrolig vigtige, og også underkendte. Uh, the, the translators are so important. At, og øh, som forfatter opdager man, når man er så heldig øh, at, at udkomme i udlandet, som, som øh, det jo er, og som jeg også oplever, så er, kan man ikke nok øh, værdsætte, eller man kan ikke overvurdere betydningen af oversættelser, fordi det er ikke mekanisk, det er en gendækning. It, uh, it, it's, uh, you have to reinvent the book or recreate it. Og øh, en bog, som øh, under overfladen, det, er, det, det har måske været en djævels kompliceret bog at oversætte, fordi at det er en bog, der presser sproget helt ud på grænsen. 
det er det, øh, den stemme eller de stemmer, der taler, der er nemlig altid flere stemmer, der taler i, øh, i Daisy's univers, er en, en stemme, der har som et spil med en anden person, altså det, det er hovedpersonen og moren, de drejer sproget og opbygger en helt særlig sprogverden. Og der har jo på en eller anden måde, så har Rasmus jo skulle finde danske ekvivalenter til noget, som man slet kan forestille sig, hvordan det hedder på engelsk. Så skal vi ikke spørge Rasmus, hvordan, øh, hvordan øh, har det kunne lade sig gøre og genskabe den her bog, og hvordan finder man kombinationen af lojaliteten over for forfatteren, og så den frihed, som han har tilladt sig for at kunne genskabe den. Så so vi kunne ask Rasmus, how is it possible, because the, this book uh, uh, is, is squeezing the language and the, and the play between the main character and, and the mother, the way they, they the, 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 the linguistic world they're building up for themselves, it, it has been, it's completely convincing, rebuilt in Danish, and, and how is that possible? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Well, I think translation is its a weird mix of creativity and art and exact science, basically, because it's very possible to do it wrong. It's, but there are so many ways to do it right. I mean, you could give the same text to five or ten different translators and the results would be very different. So, but, but what I try to do, yes, I need to be loyal to the um, atmosphere and the, the tone of the book. Um, but once I have those The, the framework, then linguistically, I'm able to take some chances and, 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 and be more creative and more free. And of course, especially in a book like Everything Under, where there are so many words that don't really exist. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. So that, yeah, that, I thought Rasmus is going to struggle with this one. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but that, yeah, that's, that's what I love when I translate something like that, because <laughs> that, that gives me a certain sense of freedom, because I know this word does not exist, so mm -hmm. I can make something up. Mm -hmm. I can be creative, I can use my own mind and my own creativity to find an, an equivalent, and um, as long as it's not you know, totally different mm -hmm. in, in tone and nuance and, and all sorts of things, so it has to be you know, believably spoken by that person. Um, who says the word in English. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, I, I can't take something completely different, completely left field, and, and just throw it in there. It has to be believable in, in the mouth of that character. So, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it is complicated, but, but it's great too. I mean, I, I would much rather translate a complicated, beautifully written book than some sort of run-of-the-mill, <laughs> uninteresting, um, badly written drivel. Um, so, <laughs> really, so, yeah. Yeah, when you talk about it, you um, both of you have sort of spoken about the process very much as a sort of play, play trying to keep that play element, which I think is really, yeah. really interesting and um, and and, ha and hard. I think you know how to keep when it's just when it's just you and and the book, um, whether your text or someone else's text, how to keep that entertainment going. I think it's something that's really, really difficult that I find very, very difficult. Um, how to make it not feel like a slog because I think readers can experience your slog through the writing. <laughs> yeah. Ja, at øh, det er optaget af det her med, at det får en lejende kvalitet, både oversættelsen og den skabende proces, som både Rasmus og jeg har talt om, hvor hun siger, at det, det kan være svært, at man sidder der alene med bogen og presset og, og så videre. Hvordan fastholder man lejen? Øhm, det vi talte om, inden vi gik ind, det var på et eller andet tidspunkt, og begynde at snakke med jer, altså, eller at, at få noget fra jer, fordi det er også en, øh, en slags øh, chance, ikke? det er jo ikke tit, man lige får den her konstellation. Så det vil sige, we talked about getting some questions mm. from, from, the, uh, from the audience, og, og det er vigtigt at sige, at man behøver overhovedet ikke at øh, have læst hverken øh, mine eller Daisy's bøger. Det, det kan være, fordi at de ting, vi taler om, altså øh, øh, køn og mandligt og kvindeligt og døden og børn og øh, at lege og at skrive og kreativitet, det er jo noget, vi alle sammen kender til. Så det vil sige, at, øh, at hvis der var øh, nogen, der kunne øh, optænke et eller andet spørgsmål, ligegyldigt hvad, så kunne vi øh, ligesom, øh, komme til at tale lidt med hinanden. Kunne det ikke lade sig gøre? Se, det fik vi lige med det samme også. Jeg ved ikke om, skal det være på engelsk eller dansk? Hvad som helst, ja, så, så oversætter vi bagefter. Um, but it's for, uh, for Daisy. Um, it seems like when Peter asked you about your creative process, that originally you had an easier time 
getting the flow of the writing going uh, because you did not have the experience that you were writing about, mm -hmm. except from other people, mm -hmm. from, from books. Mm -hmm. um, but now, when you've grown older and you've actually experienced some of the uh, life on your own body, becoming a mother, uh, and, and your own experiences as a human being, it has suddenly become a bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how do you think about that? When, when it, it, it should be easier for you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because now it's your own experiences instead of uh, experiences that you've read about mm -hmm. uh, from literature. Vil du oversætte yeah. det lige her? Spørgsmålet gik på, øhm, hvordan det er at tænke over det her. Det, det burde jo egentlig blive lettere at skrive øh, efterhånden, som man bliver ældre. Når man har flere personlige erfaringer at bygge på, og man ved mere om, hvordan det er at skrive en bog. Men, men det tyder på, at det faktisk er blevet sværere i det her tilfælde. At der er flere tankeprocesser, der griber forstyrrende ind i den, i, i den rent kreative proces. Så. Um, that's very discerning, yes. Uh, thank you. That's a good question. Um, and I think it's I think it's really really true. I think um, you know uh, I th I think you feel that it will get easier with each book, and in fact it has got harder. But I hope that the writing has got better. And I think certainly, as you say, beginning to experience some of the things I'm writing about has made it harder because because you potentially can become confused about trying to tell the truth in your fiction. You know, um, for me, and for me certainly, I can never write about the place that I'm in at, in at the time, you know. Um, I, have to, I have to leave it so that what I'm writing about is not the tree over there, it's my memory of the tree, um, which changes the tree and which means that I can change the tree so that it fits in with what I want to write about. I think, For me, I've always wanted the books that I'm writing to feel like a universe that I've created, which is not necessarily our universe, but that's a universe that you as a reader step into, and for a time you exist within that place. Um, but after you experience something, I think you do really what you feel instinctually that you want someone to understand exactly you know, what happened. The problem is that I think um, truth doesn't come across in fiction, you know. You often hear writers say, you know, no one would ever believe this if I wrote it down. And you have to remember, I think, that you're, you know, you're writing a book. Um, and you have to keep rem reminding yourself over and over and over again of that, I think. And you have to, you have to be able to have the memory of the tree rather than the actual tree in front of you. Um, I hope that answers your question. It was a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> og øh, jeg, jeg prøver lige at sammenfatte det. Øhm, det siger, at, at Daisy er glad for spørgsmålet, og øh, hun siger, at, øh, at, øh, at det er et paradoks. Ikke? På en måde skulle man tro, at det blev lettere, fordi at, øh, til at begynde med, så havde hun bare erfaringerne fra bøger, men nu har hun erfaringerne selv, så man skulle tro, det blev lettere, men det er omvendt. Det bliver sværere. Og så prøver hun at overveje, hvad, hvad kan grunden til det være? Jamen måske er kravene til autenticitet, bliver stadig større, jo ældre man bliver, og med hver bog man har skrevet. Altså ægtheden, kravet til ægthed bliver større. Og samtidig er det også et paradoks, fordi hvad vil det sige, at det er ægte, det man skriver? Altså hun siger, at på en måde kommer sandheden jo ikke igennem i fiktion, fordi hun må altid have en afstand. For eksempel det, hun skriver om aldrig det træ, der er lige uden for vinduet. Hun skal ligesom væk fra det, også stedsmæssigt væk fra det, og så kan hun begynde at lave det om. Men så er det jo samtidig ikke ægte mere. Så det vil sige, at der er et slags paradox eller et kompliceret øh, øh, område i det, ikke? Altså den uskyld, man, det helt, som hun også beskrev før, som det helt, den helt unge pige i begyndelsen af 20'erne kunne skrive med, er på en eller anden måde gået tabt, men så siger hun forhåbentlig, at der så kommet better writing, altså øh, nogle, nogle litterære kvaliteter. May I ask you, um, Daisy, we, we were talking about, vi, vi talte om det, vi spiste før, at, uh, at det, man er optaget af uh, som forfatter, altså som menneske, men altså også som forfatter, det er at nå andre. Uh, for mig personligt er det sådan, at uh, i lige de her år, der skriver jeg ikke, der underviser jeg i, uh, 
yoga og meditation, og det er fordi, jeg, og jeg, det jeg kom til at savne, da jeg skrev, det var at følge mennesker i, i dybere udviklingsprocesser, altså at møde mennesker dybere. Og det kunne jeg ikke i længden med læsere. Altså man kan møde sit kort øjeblik på et bibliotek eller sådan et sted som her, men, men, men det er meget kort, og selvom man godt kan mærke på nogen, nej, den person, der har bogen virkelig nået frem til den pågældendes hjerte, så er mødet jo meget kort, og så skilles man igen. Hvorimod, når jeg underviser mennesker, og, man, og måske gennem overlange processer, så er der en mulighed for at følge dem, og der kan komme dybere møder afsted. Det talte vi om før, da vi var ude at spise. I describe what we talk about out, out there about the possibility of meeting people and about my own choice in these years of, of teaching. Mm. When, but what we agree about was the, the, the wish to communicate deeply and then being met by the reader. So may I ask you this situation mm. just now as we sit sitting here, <laughs> how, is, how is it for you? We, we have these two very deep books and very uh, written from, from whatever the truth It is from deep within. That's, mm. There's no doubt about that. And and also it, it's a risk because there, there's a, a nakedness in the books. And how is it to be in front this moment mm. of this audience? Uh, and, and do you feel that they meet you or mm. there is a meeting taking place or what is it like? But then at a sit for en jer for hende lige nu, der har skrevet de her bøger, som har den her nøgenhed. Og hvordan kommer der et møde i stand, eller hvordan føles den her situation? Yeah, I think um, for me it's always re a really re rewarding experience. Um, I think because um, you know you you write a book and you work very very hard on it and you put a lot of yourself into it, um, but then you know you, you throw it ahead of yourself and it very quickly becomes someone else. You know the the book belongs to the readers; it doesn't belong to the author anymore. And so often I've been at events and someone's asked a question. Um, and it will be asked in a way that I've never even considered, or that, or they'll have picked something up from the book which I hadn't thought of. Um, and that happens continuously throughout the years. Um, and I find that just extraordinary. I think that you know you can write something, and um, a lot of other people, hopefully, a lot of other people can um, experience in such a way it, it in such a way that it becomes an, something else. You know, it's constantly a different creature. It's constantly changing. Um, And you're right, it is a very temporary relationship. You know, you often don't meet readers more than once. Um, but I've, yeah, to my, I think to my surprise, I found it um, a very extraordinary situation of, you know, offering a book and finding it come back. And um, what is sometimes hard is that sometimes a level of autobiography is um, supposed, which isn't there, um, you know, I think, Um, sometimes people think the book is, is about you or certain things that have happened in the books are about you and that's not always true and um, that can be difficult, I think, but yeah. <laughs> det, det, der egentlig svarer på her, det er jo, at øh, det, hun siger, det er, at når man har skrevet en bog og udgiver den, så det, man egentlig gør, det er sådan set, at man kaster den ud i verden, og den tilhører ikke længere på det tidspunkt forfatteren, men tilhører nu læserne. Øhm, og det kan være et meget, meget, meget givende øjeblik, og så møde de pågældende læsere, som kan finde på at stille spørgsmål, eller tage fat i specifikke aspekter af bogen, som forfatteren måske ikke engang selv havde tænkt på. En, en fortolkning, som er noget helt andet, øhm, end, end, end det forfatteren måske tænkte på, da hun skrev det. Og det, det, det er jo dybt interessant, fordi så kommer bogen tilbage til forfatteren som et andet væsen, som en helt anden ting, end det den var, da den blev afleveret til forlaget i, i sin tid. Og det er jo overraskende. Øh, en, en, en super fed oplevelse. Um, så så det, det er, der, der er en vis taknemmelighed forbundet med det, um, den oplevelse. Jeg tror, vi har et spørgsmål fra salen her. Ja. Find en vej derop. So I might like some words, um, but I'll try. Um, the thing about um, in the, in the, uh, oh, um, i dansk analyse, der hvor vi i, i skolen lærer den der bog, hvad, hvad handler den om? Det havde jeg, fordi 
der var jeg altid næsten uenig i, hvad der ligesom blev sagt om, hvad den handlede om, fordi jeg egentlig så nogle andre ting i det. Så det med, at det der mørke kammer, som egentlig er, når man åbner en bog, øh, så det der med, hvad fremkalder det egentlig, som du også sagde, Peter, med, jamen, når man starter på noget, hvad popper så egentlig op, og hvad, oh, ja, pop, hvad popper op i den enkelte, og det med, muligvis er man ikke enig med nogen, men man har bare den der ene, øh, som når det er med at få i jeres proces med, når nogen læser det igennem, det der med at blive edited eller redigeret, er det så ikke også nede på ordniveau, at redaktøren synes ikke, at det ord skal bruges, men egentlig skal være noget andet. Øhm. Og så er der, den, der er en film, der hedder den der En flænge i himlen, hvor nogen er nede og besøger Anna Franks øhm, for at finde den der forfatter, fordi jamen, bogen sluttede jo lige midt i en sætning, og den kan ikke bare slutte i en sætning, så det med at få fat i kraven på ham forfatteren med, hvad er fortsættelsen? Så det der med at komme, ja, den der film, og, og den her omhandler jo også nogle af de der helt ja, essentielle ting, der er i livet. Øh, ja, og tak, tak for jeres, øh, det I gør. <laughs> Ej, spændende. Um... Many uh, big, big questions. Uh, uh, um, what is um, the the um, the lady who asked the question was bothered in school by analysis, uh, who, where she she didn't agree necessarily with the the official uh, uh, edition of the what, what what was supposed to be in the book, and and uh, how how about that? That's one question, and another is when we are being edited by an editor, how uh, is the creative freedom when it when it confronts uh, an editor's wish of taking it in a special direction, mm -hmm. and um, and then uh, also um, you know uh, at last the, 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 this film this rift in the sky about Anna Frank's uh, diaries and uh, and the wish to uh, find out where the book would continue if it had been but it but it stops in mid sentence um, so altså hvis det er kæmpe store spørgsmål så hvis vi nu jeg tager et af dem det er det her med øh, en analyse kontra andre måder at opleve en bog eller kunst på. Altså jeg vil sige, at for mig personligt, så er, der, så er det vigtigste ved kunst, det er aldrig forståelsen og analysen. Det, der er det allervigtigste, det er, når, når kunsten åbner en flænge i himlen. Den åbner et eller andet mellem mennesker, når man deler kunst sammen. Så hvis man venter et øjeblik i stillheden, så er der inde i den stillhed, inden analysen kommer og sammenligningerne og er den, er den bedre eller dårligere end sidste gang, så er der sådan et magisk øjeblik, som man kan falde ind i. Skal, skal vi ikke prøve, hvis jeg nu læser en sætning af, af gangen, øh, så, så kan vi prøve at mærke, hvis vi prøver ligesom at slå hovedet fra, og så bare mærke ind i den stillhed, der kommer efter det i sidste sætning, og bare et øjeblik, for ligesom at forstå konkret, hvad jeg mener. Um, for me, the analysis is much less than the silence after the the enjoy after having enjoyed art. There's an, art opens a rift in the sky, and in this rift, you see like into another reality. So I always suggest that people remain silent just very shortly after an experience before the uh, compare the, the, uh, the something brings com comparison yeah. comparison and, and the evaluating and, and the analysis mm -hmm. because it always closes mm -hmm. the experiences. So I suggest that I read some of your a few sentences <laughs> and we just feel the the the, the, the silence speak afterwards. So. Jeg råder, vi er med de her to piger, og de kommer ud til det her skæbnesvang og barndomshjem ved havet. Og, og så fortsætter teksten sådan her, min the two girls by the sea and ja. Uh, yeah. Jeg råder efter et blomtørklæde dybt i lommen og pusser næse. Solen er på vej ned, men brænder stadig mine skuldre. Jeg har nogle halspastiller i lommen, dækket af blødt fluller. Jeg sutter en ud i kænden. 
Kusa ba? Feeling. Den her dybe kærlighed mellem pigerne, og så en enorm intensitet som konfrontativ, som mennesker, der virkelig elsker hinanden, det er så farligt at elske. Der er et skilt på husmuren, dækket af snavs. Jeg tør det af med lomteklæde, indtil jeg kan læse, hvad der står. The Settle House. Vi har aldrig boet i et hus med et navn før. Aldrig boet i et hus, der ser ud som det her klamt, vinderskævt, beskidt over det hele. Septemberets krop snor rundt. Jeg lukker øjnene hurtigt fem gange efter hinanden, så hun ikke falder. Og hvis hun gør, så lander hun som kat. Jeg ser mig tilbage efter mor. Hun skubber sig væk fra bilen. Hendes krop ser ud, som om hun har fået meget slæb på. Sådan har hun været formelt eller tavs lige siden det, der skete på skolen. Så slår man bare al forståelse fra og bare ligesom mærker musikken og intensiteten. Og falder eller synker. Og, og det tror jeg, at det dybeste kunst kan give, det er den der, øh, som Karen Bliksen siger, til sidst taler tavsheden. Karen Bliksen siger, at last the silence speaks. And that is, I think, what, what's the greatest thing art has to do. It opens another dimension, and you can't contain it in, in an analysis or, uh, or language. <laughs> Mere spørgsmål? Ja. It's a question for you, Daisy. How do you know um, when a new story is coming to you, or your characters are coming? What what is that that process for you? Oh, that's a good question. That's a hard question. Um, sorry, did you want to translate the question? Sorry. Yes. Det går på, øhm, hvornår man ved, hvornår Daisy ved, at det er en ny historie under opsejling. Hvornår opstår personerne, karaktererne, hvornår opstår de enkelte elementer? Hvad, hvad, hvad kommer først? Er det rigtigt forstået? Det var sådan, ja. Um, yeah. yeah, so often there'll be a, a sort of a seed of something for quite a long time before, um, before I sit down to write it. Um, uh, and it will, for, for everything under, um, It was um, I, I wanted to write a retelling, and then the retelling that um, I wanted to write has this sort of um, has this sort of momentum to it, which it very much feels like there's a, a ball at the top of a hill and it rolls and it rolls down and it's unstoppable. And I wanted to see if I could reflect that feeling in a contemporary retelling. Um, but it took me a really, really long time to find who the characters were, um, to find where the location was. It changed location many, many times. Um, uh, with the book I'm currently writing, which I'm still writing, um, it was, um, I knew I wanted to write something about um, um, absence, um, and that was the only word I had, and I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be or what form it was going to take, um, so it was sort of, I think, just, um, just exploring outwards from that and trying to see what I could do with it and, um, yeah, trying to play around and Um, uh, but there's always that slight flicker of something, I think, um, and it doesn't, you know, I think, um, it doesn't always become something. Sometimes, I don't know if um, Peter and Rasmus experience this as writers, but um, there, there's sometimes a flicker and you think, aha, that is it, and, you know, that's the next thing, um, and it isn't always, and um, it's maybe one of the questions I'm asked most by, you know, sort of, um, university students is how well, how do you know which of the ideas is going to be a successful one um, <laughs> and I think that you know the answer is um, well you don't you know you try you try them um, you try them out and you see um, and at some point you, you give up on some of them and at some point you carry on with others um, and it's uh, you know I don't know if I've become any better at knowing which ones are going to be successful um, 
and I, you know, some of them would be successful if you were writing them at a different time. Um, some of them you write things and then they'll appear in other projects later. Um, and I said, yeah, I suppose that's that's part of you know, of writing as something continuous rather than just books. Is that um, you know ideas pop up and bubble throughout everything that you're writing. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um. Dels så begynder med at fortælle, at uh, everything under opstod ud af et ønske om at genfortælle. Uh, I det her tilfælde noget mytologi, som I kan læse om, når I læser bogen forhåbentlig. Um, og det handlede om at få genfortalt den her myte på en måde, så den simpelthen bare ligesom tog i sit eget liv. Uh, det udenom karaktererne, uh, scenariet, stederne, det tog meget, meget lang tid at, at finde på. Uh, det, det kom først senere. Uh, I den bog, Dels sidder og skriver på i øjeblikket, som vi glæder os vanvittigt til, er færdig. Um, der handler det om et ord. Hun havde et ord i hovedet, som var fravær, absence. Uh, og så handler det om at prøve at lege med det ord, og, og ligesom få det bygget byg uden på det ord. Se, hvad, hvad der sker, når man, når man leger med det ord. Prøv at bygge på og finde på aspekter og mulige handlingsforløb og alt muligt andet. Og det er tit, hun bliver spurgt om, hvordan hun ved, hvilke idéer der bliver frugt, og hvilke idéer der bliver til noget, og hvilke der må kasseres. Og det gør man heller ikke altid. Nogle idéer kan blive en succes, hvis de var skrevet på et andet tidspunkt eller i en, en anden situation. Nogle bliver det senere og bliver taget, genoptaget i et nyt projekt på et andet tidspunkt. Så det er aldrig helt til at Man er nødt til at prøve sig frem, indtil det så lykkes. Og hvis jeg selv vil ikke have en til at det lykkes. Me too. Det er sådan, at vi har en anden spørgsmål her fra the audience. I should like to ask you both Daisy and Peter, uh, as two authors who've had a lot of success, both popular and critic, uh, critically acclaimed books early in life, uh, how, do, how do you move on from that? I should think that it would be very anxiety-provoking to sit down and write the next book. Um, or, or isn't it? Is it just uh, wonderful? Or, or did you have trouble Uh, uh, believing that you could write uh, another really good one. Yeah. Om, uh, om, uh, vi på både det siger, jeg bliver spurgt om, uh, hvordan, uh, hvad har det betydet for skriveprocessen og måske også for livet at have fået oplevet medgang tidligt med bøgerne. Hvad, 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 det pres, som det putter på en. Ikke? Hvordan kommer man så med den næste bog? Øhm. Jeg tror, for, for, øh, for min del, så... Øh, altså, altså, for ikke ligesom at gøre det mere indviklet, end det er, i, i basketball. Øhm, så øh, når, når man dribler frem mod kurven og skal score, så bliver man presset af forsvaret. Og øh, hvis man vil spille basketball, så må man også kunne score øh, under pres fra forsvaret. Altså når man er trykket, ikke? Man skal på en eller anden måde. Det er noget af det fascinerende ved basketball. Det er jo, at det er finmotorisk. Så det vil sige, at man skal være, kunne være fuldstændig afslappet, mens man er sprunget og ligesom svæver mod kurven, helt afslappet, samtidig med, at der er to store, brutale forsvarsspillere, der presser ind fra begge sider. Så skal man ligesom kunne tsk, øh, øh, droppe bolden lige så forsigtigt ned i kurven. Og noget, noget beslægtet er man nødt til som forfatter. Altså hvis man vil være i den branche, så skal man også under tryk udefra kunne... Øh, øh, kunne Altså man, må kunne, man skal arbejde med de indre dommer. Problemet er jo dybt set en selv. Det er jo ikke kritikken og folk uden for en selv. Det er jo ens egen øh, ubarmhjertighed og ligesom, øh, øh, pisken sig selv. Det er jo det, der er problemet. Og, og det må man arbejde med, og det må man komme over. Hvis, hvis trangen til at øh, fortælle og skrive bøger er dyb nok, så, så kommer man også forbi det, og det er man også nødt til, for at gøre det usentimentalt. 
the, 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 to, to give a rough answer, uh, <laughs> is that it, it resembles a little basketball. If you want to put the ball in the basket, you have to be able to be completely relaxed with a part of yourself and at the same time being squeezed by the defense very hardly. <laughs> yeah. So so and if you can't if you can't find that then you can't be an author because the the the, the audience or the the, the um, the media is a hard place to be, the very cold winds. And the basic problem is yourself, your old inner uh, uh, judgment. The, where you are hard on yourself and you are, yeah, so, and, and you have to deal with that. Uh, and if creativity comes from a very deep place, you will find ways to deal with that. That's this uh, short answer. <laughs> and, and then practically, I think I, I, I felt that when I started writing, I knew there was a risk. I felt this is, a, you're going on a, on a stage, and this stage contains risk. So I asked myself, what is really important in life? And I said, love is important. That means love for, for my, my partner, and my children, and my parents, and the close friends. So love is a, a priority. And then uh, meditation is a prior priority, this spiritual quest that was from early in my life. And then writing the books as good as I can. These three priorities, they, uh, they uh, clean the table, they, they, they are the first. And I have sticked to that. So that means all journeys and media and television and offers comes a lot further down the list. So I had protected myself for many years. I lived without a phone and my address was always secret. So I separated myself from the pressure from outside, trying to protect these three priorities. And I think that that's part of what that has helped me. I have sticked to that for now, 35 or 40 years. And, uh, and, and that, that have helped me. <laughs> um, I think that's probably the perfect answer to your question. <laughs> um, and my critical success has not been as, as big as Peter's, but um, yeah, I think what Peter said about you know making the books that you're working on the best book you could possibly can um, can do is um, is really really important. And focusing on what you're writing at the moment, and I always try and um, that's not a, met a metaphor as good as the basketball metaphor, but I always I'm always trying to work on something so that there's always another book ahead, um, you know, like a shark. I try and keep keep moving, keep moving, and and then you don't become you don't become dis disconnected from the writing. You're very much focusing on um, you know the writing that's in front of you, and um, and I think I'm helped by that feeling of giving the book away. Um, yeah, it's a book that someone else wrote almost. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments from anyone? Well then, before the Rasmus, do you have anything? No, I'm no. Okay. Well, before we then, one more question. Yes. The, 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 what do you call it? The five books that you have, the, the quotes from the from the um. Of Finn Podensk. Yeah. Um, to, to both of you. Um, in in art in the in the oh yeah there's some uh, Stendhal syndrome in uh, Firenze where if people go to the Uffizi um, uh, spectral thing and see all the the paintings there there's a syndrome where they can uh, um, be totally um, yeah not sick but but have um, be overwhelmed. Um, have you had such overwhelming in um, in literature by your colleagues um, in um, yeah in in all the centuries you have um, um, read the books and so on so to both of you and no, all, all three of you. <laughs> first you. Oh, first me. Oh, yes. first you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll go first. No, you're the best. <laughs> uh, well, I am actually, I'm, I'm frequently overwhelmed, um, <laughs> both as a, as, a, as a reader and as a translator. I mean, um, I, I'm lucky enough to be in the 
in, in, in the company of great, great literature for most of my waking hours. Um, and, and I find great literature overwhelming, and I feel almost not, exactly, not sick, as you said, but, but, but yeah, overwhelmed. I mean, I, I, mean I, I get dizzy and I get uh, headaches and I get, but, but in a nice way. I mean, I, <laughs> I must say, as, as, as a translator, I've, I've, I've experienced it a few times. Uh, George Orwell, um, 1984, was a great experience for me to translate. But also these two books by Daisy Johnson, because of that linguistic intensity and, and, and the beauty and the, the wildness and the, the intensity, there, there was just not almost too much, but just enough <laughs> to, <laughs> to be slightly overwhelmed, but in a very, very good way. And I, yeah, so, but, but I have that experience quite frequently. I love reading great books, and I do that all the mm. time, and I love translating great books, and I do that a lot too. So yeah, I, I, I know the feeling. Mm. I, I don't think that I feel very often overwhelmed. Uh, 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 at, uh, but I understand very well the question. The, the singer-songwriter Tom Waits uh, has described he didn't his whole life hear any opera. He didn't, he did hardly know it existed. It couldn't happen in Denmark, but the Karol Barsky, you would say, at, uh, at Tom Waits, he grew up without to hear opera. Og så i, var han på besøg hos Scorsese, filminstruktøren Scorsese, og Scorsese spillede opera. Så for første gang, så hører han Maria Callas, eller hvem det er, synge opera. Og han sagde, it was like giving a five-year-old a cigar. I turned green in the head and started to cry. <laughs> Det var, det var som at give en femårig en cigar, ikke? Jeg blev grøn i hovedet og begyndte at græde. Så det er jo sådan en, en over, overvældelse. Og den kan jeg huske fra, jeg var yngre. Nu tror jeg bare, at jeg bliver meget, meget taknemmelig. I, I think I become very grateful. Jeg har nylig, jeg skulle... I efteråret var jeg inviteret til Bliksenmuseet for at sige noget om Karl Bliksen. Og så genlæste jeg en række af historierne, de så til mig, was at the Blixen Museum, to talk about Count Blixen, he said Dinesen, and I read, I reread some of the stories, and I just felt so grateful. Uh, jeg følte mig bare så taknemmelig. I, um, I Østen, yeah, I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a really, really brilliant question. Um, I, I think I know exactly the feeling that you're talking about. You know, you, you feel it here, I think, and you know, that sort of tight feeling. And, um, um, and I, yeah, I, I, I get it quite often with really, really brilliant literature. And um, at, as for then trying to write after that, I, you, it is almost impossible, you know, because you read, the, you read someone's sentences and you think, oh, well, that's the most perfect sentence anyone has ever written. Why should I ever write again? <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, but maybe everyone in this room remembers uh, what it's like to read that book, that kind of thing, when you're a teenager. And I, I remember, you know, those books that I read when I was 13, 14, 15, you know, which completely explode through you. And that, that kind of feeling and... Um, Yeah, it's a very astounding feeling, and I think we're very lucky to have it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Also the also the heart and also the soul of expression. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of um, like when you go over a bridge, and your belly's left behind in the air. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if you can ever have that experience reading something or watching an opera the, a second time. I wonder if it's that um, that initial uh, uh, shock of the first time you experience it, maybe. Yeah. And then it's the, 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 the point of every, uh, re, uh, reunite with the, you, you, you might get, get to the feeling you had on the sofa or the, you might even remember where you're lying down or what were you breathing so on the, the exact thing uh, or, or just what you call it a sight. Um, just a touch. A touch of, yeah. of the memories. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
a, f a friend of mine says that uh, what's nice about novels is that you can move into them and live there a week. Altså, det er noget af det særlige ved romaner, det er, at man kan flytte ind og bo i dem i en uge. Det er der ikke ret meget andet kunst, man kan. Altså, en film er jo alligevel overstået på nogle timer, så klinger det, og musik, ikke? så klinger det videre i en, og man kan se den igen eller spille den igen. But no novels, it's unique with novels, you can live in them for a week, mm -hmm. which is not possible with the music mm -hmm. or film, so it's one of the extraordinary qualities. And then your own creativity, when you see a film, you get the sound, you get the pictures, and you get the story. You have to produce less yourself, but books, your own creativity, it demands, you can't read it without producing a lot of pictures and a lot of uh, connection and structure. So could, could we end that with reading a piece of, uh, of uh, Daisy? Uh, will it be okay, as we yeah. 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 It was, uh, we have some heat little uh, family feeling, for we have jo, uh, Anders and Jesper with some screaming books. Ikke? They have fantastic forlag, som uh, udgiver fra hjertet, uden hensyn til, om det kunne kommersielt gå eller ej. Så bare ligesom derude af, og virkelig øh, vigtige bøger. Så det har været meget specielt for os at sidde derude og opdage, ligesom, hvor mange fælles interesseområder vi har, og så få lov at føle sig som en øh, familie eller en lille mafia, der er øh, optaget af de samme ting. Hvad siger du? Hun I think Peter reads it better than me, probably. But, but thank you. <laughs> Let, let's hear, would you read a, a, a short piece? Sure, yes. <laughs> um, okay. It is hard even now to know where to start. For you, memory is not a line, but a series of baffling circles, drawing in and then receding. At times, I come close to violence. If you were the woman you were 16 years ago, I think I could do it. Beat the truth clean out of you. Now it is not possible. You are too old to beat anything out of. The memories flash like broken wine glasses in the dark and then are gone. Thank you. Efter jeg fandt dig på floden og tog dig med, med tilbage til huset, begyndte jeg at drømme en drøm. Jeg er i kælderen under ordbogskontoret, hvor jeg arbejder. Der er ingen vinduer. Rummet er kun oplyst af store, skålformede lamper, som hænger lidt for langt ned fra det snavse, panerede luft. Der er rækker af arkivskab i metal. Ti eller flere er fyldt med ord stavet bagfra. Andre timer over, som i tidens løb er gået af brug. Der er udtværet håndaftryk på væggene, et gamle fodaftryk i støvet på gulvet, lyset er tændt på et lille bitte toilet, selvom ingen svarer, der banker på. Af interesse kigger jeg i B-skabet, bladrer igennem de gule kort, men det er der ikke. Bonak, det er et nøgleord i den her fortælling. Selvfølgelig er det der ikke. Der er ikke engang et rigtigt ord. Det findes ikke. Jeg går hen ad gangen i retning af elevatoren. Jeg ved godt, det er en drøm, for i virkeligheden blev den sat i stand længe før jeg begyndte at arbejde her. Men nu er den gammel med en gitterdør, som jeg skubber til side og trykker ind mellem væggene, beklædt med rødt, rødt fløjl. Elevatoren bevæger sig langsomt, rasler sig vej gennem etagerne. We've reached the end. <laughs> I've reached the end. But before the applause, a few, one practical uh, remark. There is a, an opportunity to meet Daisy and uh, buy the book and have it signed just outside here. And uh, yeah, we'll go on mm -hmm. out there straight away. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be. Can, you can meet Daisy outside. And yeah, I want you to give a very big applause to the three. Great people.